Welcome to Hiring Happy Humans, where we talk about all things HR with a variety of folks, from CEOs to community partners, sharing up-to-date trends, best practices, and our wild workplace stories. Each interview is designed to leave you with the knowledge to keep your sanity. I'm your host, Dawn Sipley of Sipley the Best. Thanks for joining in, and let's jump into this week's episode. Welcome everybody back to Hiring Happy Humans with Simply the Best. I am just so excited to bring on this very unique guest today, Samantha Kazuch. She is joining us from Austin, Texas, and she has just a really refreshing and different perspective on things as an influencer and as someone who really helps uh, women, um, you know, find what they're looking for in life. Welcome, Samantha. Thank you so much, Don. So excited to have this conversation today. Yeah, absolutely. For those of uh, my audience who aren't familiar with you, just share with us a little bit about who you are, what your company is, and how you show up in this world. Yeah, I'm the founder of the Manuscripting Journal, which is a basically a morning routine journal for women to help them get clear on their goals, what they want to not necessarily just manifest, but just to keep them focused every single day. I don't want to call this some sort of morning ritual or like some sort of plan or anything like that. It's strictly like you wake up, you use it, you get focused, you get clear on your goals. And then that kind of transpires into the rest of your day for staying focused on that. And what else I do? Well, I came, I've been an entrepreneur for over a decade now. I was in the online space. I was everything from being an influencer before influencers were even a thing, then turned social media coach because people started asking me how I did that to then online business coach, because then people started asking me, how did I build my social media business and all of that? And then three years ago, actually, I had, I never had a plan of creating and launching a physical product. Mm -hmm. But when the pandemic hit three years ago, I just started sharing with my community, my students, my clients using Instagram and Facebook, what I did for my morning routine, how I journaled. And all of a sudden I saw this incredible need and purpose for this physical product of a journal to be made. And I just dove straight into it. And it's been the most rewarding journey that I think I've ever done in my life. And it's been so exciting to see it grow, help so many women and, and help people and humanity. Yeah, absolutely. I that, I mean, product development is very different from the service world or the influencer world. What, what surprised you most uh, about that shift and, and share with us a little bit of your involvement in it, because I've had friends who have done the same. Some people touch their product. Some people never touch their product. Some people store some people. And so just share with us a little bit about the logistics of what it means yeah. to Um, be supplying the world with these beautiful journals. Yeah. So the first biggest shock that I didn't realize going into a physical product space is the profit margins. (laughs) I mean, here we are coming from, you know, being an online marketer, creating online courses, your profit margins are like really high, like, you know, 90%, maybe more depending how really good you are at what you do. And going into the e-commerce space, like, I mean, if you're, if you're making 30% margins, like profit at the end of the day, you're killing it. So that was the biggest shock. And you're putting in just, I honestly think, I think it's a lot more work just because it's a physical product. It's a tangible thing. You're dealing with shipping and manufacturing and this and then the other. So those were some big, so the biggest hurdles um, and just kind of like lessons to learn going into the space. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. You, you are right. I'm, I'm lucky as a consultant that we have pretty good margins and, and stuff like that. And I've thought about doing different physical things, but like I watched my girlfriend, um, Jesse Park. I don't know if you're familiar with her. Uh, she went from starving artist to insurance guru, to perfumer, um, mm-hmm. to a, a luxury bag line. And, um, some of the conversations that I've had with her, it's just like, I don't, she, she's got more gusto than I do. I have to be real honest. I don't want to work hard. You know, we have this kind of grind culture where we're supposed to get at it every day and they wear the 12 hour badge of honor on their chest for how much they work. And I'm like, yeah, no, I I did a solid six or seven today and I'm super satisfied with that. And I would like to be home by three, please. (laughs) Yes. Yes. I hear you on that. 
with looking at your at your Instagram, it looks like you really promote that settled down type of lifestyle um, rather than the grind lifestyle. How have you um, come upon that realization and how have you resisted the urge to to push the limits of your capabilities? Oh, I love that that's what you got from my social media because that is just such a beautiful reflection in the transformation that I've made because throughout, you know, up until maybe three, four years ago, even the last couple of years, I was very much a type A hustle and grind, work 24 seven, no days off. You know, if I'm taking a day off, I'm not making money. I'm being lazy. Like I really, like I was ingrained with that actually, just even from growing up, I'm, I'm first immigrant, first generation immigrant. So, you know, I come from a family of very hardworking people to like get to where they are today in this country. So that was kind of ingrained in me. So as I went on my entrepreneurial route, I started, of course, learning more about myself. And this is kind of funny, like comes full circle with me creating this product for women to help them turn back to themselves to like, mm -hmm. Hey, the hustle and grind, like that's not going to get you success. That's going to lead to burnout. That's going to just lead to so many negative things that ends us making us feel unhappy. Right. So for me, even though I'm a founder of an e-commerce company, we're three years in, we're scaling so, so quickly. Like my whole thing now is, and I just read this book, it's called 10X is Easier Than 2X by Dan Sullivan. My fiance recommended it to me and I read that. And now I've just learned to bring in more help into my life because I was also the type that's like, I can do it all myself. I don't need any help because I thought asking for help means like you're a failure. Like, you know, it wasn't you know, clapped upon. Right. So now I've kind of changed so many things in my lifestyle so that, Hey, I don't need to work a million hours in my business, especially if I can hire somebody to do it or bring somebody in. And then that just creates this beautiful environment. Even for me, like I love to pay people. Like I love to be able to circulate, you know, finances and money to, to people like helping support the brand. So it's just this beautiful ecosystem that I've created. And I very much learned that in my downtime, in those times that now I'm able to just travel more and not stress out and not freak out and do even things on the road, you know, that's where so much more creativity comes and ideas come and things just start coming together. So having this beautiful balance, like there are days that I have to show up and work hard, you know, it's those 10 hour days, but then having those couple days off in a row where I don't feel guilty about it, mm -hmm. it also contributes to success too. So is that, I, I find that interesting, is that your preference to pack them in a few days and then have extended periods of time off? Because I find that I'm the opposite. I really in, enjoy my work and I enjoy my work on a daily basis, but just in very snack size consumables. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. So for me and my fiance specifically, Right now, like we have a couple planned trips throughout the year, like whether it's a birthday trip or we know we have to go see family on this time or anything like that. But mm -hmm. outside of that, we are very much go with the flow. Like we have created this lifestyle where it's like, hey, like things are looking pretty light on the schedule. Like let's take off from Mexico. Like how does that sound? But I'm the same way as you. Like I really love what I do. Yeah. And of course, as you know, like being in business and especially in an e-commerce business, like you the never know. Pressures. When, you never know when something's going to pop up. Like right. there are days or weeks where I'm like, I have an empty schedule today. That looks so amazing. But I get a call from my customer service or my warehouse that, you know, X arrived and it's all damaged. And now we're going to damage control or my manufacturer calls with an issue. So it's really this lifestyle, like learning how to kind of like be quick on your feet and yeah. Over the months and years of being now in this space, I it all comes down to like how I manage my energy and emotions mm -hmm. and having a good routine to help make sure that I'm not letting everything stress me out because previously some of those things really would. And now I'm just like, you know what? This is just happening for us. We just have to deal with it. What's the best way? Who do I need to call? Who do I need to ask for help? And let's just move through it and like learn from that lesson. So that's kind of how I live my lifestyle now. Okay. Now you mentioned being a first generation immigrant. Tell us about little Samantha. How did, how did you grow up? Did you have siblings? What was your home environment like? One of my keynotes is 
on uh, how our childhoods impact who we are in the workplace. Half of what I deal with in HR is dealing with like childhood trauma and uh, neglect and things like that. Just trying to repair the human, everything that's happened to them. So share with us a little bit about little Samantha. Yeah. So that's such a great question. I don't even think I've been asked something like that on a podcast before. So this is going to be fun. Um, my parents immigrated from Poland to Australia when they were like 18 years old, like okay. full on had to flee the country basically for everything that was going on there at that time. And then a couple of years later, I was born in Australia. So I was born in Australia along okay. with my sister. And then we didn't move until the States until I was seventh, like seventh grade. Okay. But Australia, like my parents, they were the, like moved with one suitcase, you know, maybe 20 bucks to their name. Didn't even know English. Didn't even know the language. Like that's, and I didn't even learn English until my mom put me in school at five. So I went to school, not even knowing that, which mm. back then I didn't even know that. Like when you're a kid, you you don't even know. Right. Like my mom told me later on, like, yeah, you didn't even know English when you went to like preschool and first grade. I'm like, what? And then it like clicks. I'm like, oh, wait, that makes total sense. Like sometimes they would pull me out of class to make me go take these tests by myself. And I always wondered, what yeah. was I the only one? Like, <laughs> right. like no one ever explained any of that stuff to me. Right. And I think as a kid that did impact me, I don't remember in that moment why, but I remember now like that was weird mm-hmm. and it hasn't come up for me more like, you know, as an adult of like being weird, but what it drove me to is I just remembered the only thing my parents really wanted for us is, you know, to have straight A's, be a really good student, be a, and I was in sports. So it's like, be the best athlete. So I think at the same time of learning to be that people pleaser, like I did grow up to please my parents. Like I followed all the rules. I never, you know, What's even your birth order, I was the oldest and I had a sister that was a year younger And then of course, with that, you know, being a child of immigrants, like both my parents worked, they worked 24 seven, you know, some of them, some days, both of them worked at the same time and grandma would babysit us other times, you know, mom would be gone, dad would be home, then dad would be gone, mom would be home. Like it was a very, it was a very, like one of those types of lives. But the cool thing about all of that is, even though at the time, you know, we had, my parents, we had everything that we needed. I never saw or like heard or anything like that, like that we were struggling or anything like that. Like I always had food. There was always clothes. There was always a roof over my head, a warm bed, but it was just like, as we were getting older, you would notice, you know, when you would want that certain brand of clothing or something where mom's like, oh no, we can't afford that. Can't do that. So for me growing up, it was just really like ingrained in me, like, you know, work really hard, save your money, don't spend frivolously, Um, you know, make sure you just do what you're told, like follow your teachers, follow the rules, all those sorts of things. So as I got into like college and out on my own, I kind of started learning the real reality of, you know, the world and how things work. So I had a more kind of more like a little bit of a rebellious phase in college because I just felt like looking back, I was like, I was, I was so caged up, right? I couldn't, live or express myself. I was always constantly being told what to do and how to be. So it took me a good like 10 years to really come back to myself and like, learn like, what does Samantha want? Who, what is she all about? Who does she help? Like all of those certain things. And it's just so funny because now, even with the manuscripting journal, like that's what it teaches. It's part workbook where like Mm -hmm. you literally dive into all of those things and you figure those parts out about yourself. So it's it's just kind of crazy to look like full circle with my life and like what you end up doing with your life. Mm -hmm. It's like your mission and purpose. It's really funny and cool. Yeah, absolutely. Now for you, when you talk about coming back to yourself, was there an event that stopped you in your tracks Or more of an evolution of, if I keep doing this, I'm probably not going to like where I ended up. Usually people have two different paths that way. Oh, yeah. I feel like it was a mix of both because throughout my 20s. So the first kind of big thing was, is when I was going to like high school and college, I studied multiple years, even outside of college before that, to go to med school. And then when my senior year of college... I had this gut feeling and I didn't know any of this stuff, gut feeling, intuition, messages down. I didn't, you know, you're a kid at that point, like, and social media wasn't like it is today. So there was no place to really learn about those things about yourself. 
Uh, but I just like deep down inside, I was like, this isn't the right thing for me to do. I'm not supposed to go to med school. Like, I don't know why I feel like I've wasted so much time and energy to like, even just study to like, be able to take the MCAT and go do all those things. But I'm like, this isn't for me, but I also have no idea what else there is to do. And at that point, that was really hard to break to my parents because again, child of a right. first generation immigrant, they yeah. want you to be a doctor or a lawyer. Like that, like that is it, right? Like that's what you're, that's what they struggled so much for to come to this country and land to like give you this best life. So that was really hard, but I told them, I was like, I'm going to take a year off and figure it out and go back. I already knew I wasn't going to go back. So I kind of went down the entrepreneurial route. I was dating someone at the time. This guy at the time, he was an entrepreneur. It wasn't cool to be an entrepreneur back then. It was like really frowned upon. You're kind of a loser. Like, what do you do? Sell drugs? Like, what is this? But he taught me a lot and introduced me to a lot of things about entrepreneurship and doing stuff online and then social media and stuff like that came about. So as I kind of went down that way, um, that was probably about five-ish, six years. And I was, I got into modeling and acting and fitness coaching and all these different things, but I played it really, really small. Mm -hmm. Like I stayed pretty much, I moved back to like my hometown of Scottsdale, Arizona, and I just played really small. But at the same time, I was like, quote unquote, successful because I, I was living good from my twenties. Like I was making good money. I had a luxury car. I had my own condo. Like life was really good. But deep down inside, I was like, I knew I was meant for more, right. but I just never went after it because I was too afraid. And then one night I did the whole, like I said, I worked really hard, party hard on the weekends. And one night out, I got arrested mm. and it was over something really stupid. Like no one got hurt. I didn't do anything like awful. Like it was like the dumbest thing ever. But point being is I got arrested that night. And that was my biggest wake up call of like, yeah. Sam, what right. the F are you doing? Right. Like, this isn't you, you are not this girl. Mm. You need to get it together and figure it out because this isn't the way. And then literally from that moment on, I made a plan, all the things that I wanted for my life, all the things I wanted to change, where right. I wanted to live, move all of that. And that then put me on the trajectory to like, it literally completely changed my life. There you go. There you go. I I'm a, I, I do a lot of consulting around hiring. And so I do a lot of interviewing. And so I get to talk to a lot of people like, oh, on your resume, I see here that you went, <laughs> you know, yes. like, tell me that story. Yeah. So I love yeah. hearing those stories where we have kind of those aha moments and, mm -hmm. and realizations. And I would encourage you to look into parentification. Mm -hmm. um, parentification is what I keynote about. And oftentimes first generation immigrant children can find themselves doing like age inappropriate duties and responsibilities, like interpret interpreting business um, needs or showing up uh, alongside of their parents to help them negotiate things because they grew up here and they kind of understand a little bit better. And so they're always kind of that, that wing woman to their, to their mm -hmm. parents. And so there's an expectation that's this just unspoken that you will do like these things. And so you, you are called the old soul, the good child, you know, all of those. And we think right in our twenties is what I talk about that, you know, I felt like I had come out unscathed, you know, and not damaged by the, dis the things that had happened to me in my childhood. And it wasn't until I had this deep betrayal by a business partner that I realized how ignorant I was and how much blinders that I had because of my childhood neglect and abuse and, and stuff for my, my circumstance, parentification doesn't always mm -hmm. get that dark and ugly, but I would, I would look into it and I would venture to guess like for you, you probably really value your impact mm -hmm. that you have in the world. It's, I mean, the money is great, but you weren't feeling fulfilled when you couldn't see your impact in the world. And so through the social media that probably was very alluring and attractive to you because you could see your impact, right? That's, that's why it's, you know, it's, it's fun when you can quantify things like that, I'm sure. Yeah. And to your point of what you just said, it's, it's completely true because what's interesting is, you know, with the e-commerce company, the journal, I'm helping literally thousands of women. Right. And this, we're going into our fourth year of business mm. this past year, this basically is the first year in three mm -hmm. years that I'd actually even be able to pay myself. 
Like oh, wow. it drives me so much because we are, we are bootstrapped. We are self-funded and we are proud right. to say that. And I, I want yeah. to stay that way for as long as possible. Right. But it's funny. It's because I am willing to put in the blood, sweat, work, and tears right. because of the testimonials from women that are in our community and our journal, like that literally lights a fire within my heart to keep on going no matter what. And so what you just said that like, literally no one's ever said that to me and it completely nails it because before when I was doing social media or business coaching, I was making great money. Did I love what I was doing? Yeah. No, mm -hmm. like, I mean, I did, but it well, was, no, yeah, I agree with super, you, you know, fulfilling. Yeah. So right. yeah, right. really interesting. So you, you kind of set the stage here. You've got a fiance. I saw him in a few of your, your photos and stuff. What does he do? What does he think about all of this? Cause you really, your branding is very, you've got it nailed down beautifully. I always, I feel like I'm this crazy octopus out there just <laughs> floating around, but, but you're consistent with your branding. What does he think about what you're doing, what you're creating, his, his, participation in it all. What is that like for your relationship? Yeah, he loves it. So when I first came to him with the idea for the journal, he was my number one supportive friend. He was like, absolutely. Oh my God, we need to do this immediately, right. uh, which was really cool. What and does he do for work? And his background, he has, he has a couple different companies. Okay. So um, he's an he entrepreneur has, then. He's an entrepreneur as well. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. Yes. Yes. So, so he's a he dreamer has, too. Yes. Yes. Big. He's a huge time visionary. Um, so yeah, he has a electric bike company. He has a, a software app and then um, a, a couple other ones as well that he's on the board of. So he is well-versed in the space and, mm -hmm. you know, he's kind of got the eye for when he sees something like a good idea and whatever, like he's like, yeah, let's go. So um, his support through it, like even now to this day, he kind of just helps and supports me with advice, help. Like we brainstorm, we're talking about this business all the time. Right. He does a lot of the, just kind of like more like paid ads, marketing funnels, backend stuff, um, helps with like supporting my team and all of that kind of as well. So he's a, he's a big part of it. Awesome. Awesome. So where do you want to take it? What is this next? It, it sounds like you, you, you know, the three years you've, you've hatched this egg, it's coming out, it's being successful. You're seeing the fruit that you've produced. Like what is your, your longer term vision? What's your next steps? Yeah. Longer term is simply put just to make the manuscripting journal a household name. And I mean, ultimately like this is the company that I plan to exit with as well. We're building okay. you know, such a big community. It's a huge brand, um, customer base, all of that. So, so ultimately, and because, and that's also top of mind because all of my previous companies that I've built, mm -hmm. I wasn't able to sell. So I right. knew whatever the next thing that I was going to put my time and energy into, you know, if that's what it looks like down the road, when, or if it ever makes sense, like I'm, I'm doing, I'm putting the foundation in place to put ourselves in a position to, to potentially do that. If it, you know, if it happens to go that way. It's always amazing to me how many people start businesses without any kind of in, in mind, because it will, I'm, you know, we're, we're guaranteed two things in, in yeah. life and, and no one ever really has that. What is my, what is my goal for it? You know, it's almost like they're just buying the job, right? Like I'm just showing up and doing this work so I can get paid. And yeah, I pay a couple other people too, but there's no real strategy in it all. So I love that you already are keeping kind of your exit plan in mind because it can kind of help us keep our purpose yes. and help us kind of keep grounded mm -hmm. in those, those things. Yeah. Now, I know you've talked about your, your team and stuff, but do you have, um, how you're structured? A lot of small businesses, they don't even know they're like, well, you, people are always surprised that like, I have employees. They're like, oh, I thought it was you, you know? And I'm like, no, you, you think I do all this? Like, I don't have, no way. No. <laughs> and so I have what I've chosen the W2 employee route. And then I have a few contractors. And then of course my, my vendors that do my accounting and stuff like that. How have you chosen to structure your business? Are you all 1099 contractors, husbands alongside of you? You're really in the business full-time supporting it, or do you have an employed team? What does that look like? Yeah, right now we are all still 1099 okay. and we'll keep that for a while until it makes sense to switch right. anyone over as we've been growing 
um, like, I mean, we've been through so much growth. We've been from, we moved from California we started the business in California, LA. We are now in Austin, Texas. Like even with the move, we lost and gained new employees. Mm -hmm. So for us, it just made sense to be 1099 for now. Right. And right. then we'll, we'll cross that bridge, you know, when someone's with us for enough time to what, for it to make sense. Okay. Know, that's so. okay. Awesome. How did you kind of decide on the feel of your, your marketing. Um, what I notice is a lot of businesses coming out the gate, they just start splattering their crazy little thoughts because entrepreneurs are obviously insane. Um, and, and we do oftentimes like the sound of our own voice. Uh, I've been guilty of that myself, but you've really done a really good job of cultivating that vision and, and personal brand right from from the jump, did you sit down and strategize that first? Did you hire someone to help you plot that out? Because it's not always um, like that. Yeah, yeah, great question. So with with the branding and everything, I mean, that's I didn't used to teach branding, but even with being a social media influencer and a coach, I've I've known for a decade the importance of branding, and I'm an expert with Canva, and I know how to use all of those tools. So for me, um, it's just been kind of a personal thing, yeah. and it's so funny because I look at it now, and it's like because I've done it all on on our Instagram is. 95% of stuff that I've created and done. Uh, but it's just funny looking at it because I'm just like, oh, I feel like I could hire someone to make it better. Because I feel like, you know, when you do it yourself, you just feel right. like it's very DIY. So right. to hear, you know, feedback like, oh, how it's so cohesive and branded, it, it sounds really great. But yeah, I just, I just took the time to learn. And I think anyone that's, you know, starting a business or a brand, I think, and the one thing that I just remember just even from coaching others is, you know, I feel like that branding piece, it also just evolves too. Like mm -hmm. there were certain colors in the beginning when we started our brand that are no longer with us and the, and the type and style isn't with, with the brand anymore. I just knew what I wanted it to look like, to feel like, to sound like. I wanted it to be a fun, attractive to women, a more like kind of luxury brand, but no, like not like too luxurious, but inspirational. So I'm just constantly playing around with different things and, and playing around with the moods of the brand. And I'm also just talking to my community because one thing that we do is whenever we release new colors of the journal, um, I do poll, poll our community and ask them like, hey, what colors do you want to see next? And depending oh. on what their feedback is, like that kind of also helps morph and shift the feel yeah. and thinking of the branding too. So it's evolving and I love to just have fun with it. And I pay attention, like if certain things just aren't doing well and stuff like that, well, I listen and I, I make sure not to continue posting like that again. So with you having expertise in, in branding and um, the influencer space and all that, share with us just a few tips for those who are kind of DIY in it um, and, and whatnot. What would you, what, how did you guide your clients through that space previously? Yeah, I think with, if you're looking to figure out branding or your colors or even your fonts and stuff, honestly, jump into Canva. I know it can seem kind of intimidating at first because you see so many different graphics and all that sort of stuff, but honestly, just play around in there. Go, go look at different things. What I love about it is, and I mean, a lot of the graphics that we even use or the templates that we use, mm -hmm. it's from stuff that's already been created. Right. All the fonts are there, all the colors are there. And then not be afraid to get hung up on not having your branding all finished and done before putting yourself out there. Right. Because like I said, I feel like branding really evolves. Like mm -hmm. if you look even at my, I mean, I started a new Instagram account three years ago for my okay. first one of being- I was Instagram. wondering because it didn't oh. seem to go back that, that yeah. far. Yeah. So I was like- oh. Yeah, I, I, I had started that old Instagram account from literally when Instagram started. So that was like, what, 10 years ago? Right. And over the years of the pivots of my different careers, I was like- you know what? I think it's time oh, for a fresh start with being the founder of the Marriage Gifting Journal. But even just if you were to scroll back through my entire, you know, career on there, there were so many different color themes and then fonts and styles because my branding evolved with me. Mm -hmm. And all I really just start to do is, you know, I just start putting stuff out there, just start posting right, and have a little bit of an idea what you want to do. But I wouldn't say like, don't 
think, oh, I can't launch or I can't start posting until yeah. I have my brand colors and my fonts. Like, no, like that's just wasting time. Just, just get out there, use Canva or any other of those editing tools. They make it so easy, uh, but you just have to take some time and play around with it. Yeah. Have you ever done any personality testing to see, to learn more about your, what drives you or what demotivates you or, and all of that? Oh, I, I have taken some in the past because it was okay. a requirement a long time ago for a mastermind that I was entering. Okay. I literally cannot remember okay. what it is. Yeah. Like, I think you would, I think it. you would really enjoy it. And it would be, I would think a fascinating topic to, to journal on the different insights that it kind of gives you. Um, I find that the uh, paradigm, the big five, um, ocean is really good. It's the only scientific one. And then it's the only one that you can use when making hiring decisions. You know, disc is very famous and Enneagram is, you know, on the internet, but it's all kind of, it, it doesn't have the empirical data yeah. behind it to, to be able to make legal decisions, hiring decisions, kind of things like that. So you might, it, it might be something that you want to just look into and, and kind of play with because it's like, Oh, what drives me or what, you know, how do I pay attention to detail? How do I process information? What, what demotivates me, what makes me angry. And, and so it's always really fascinating to unwrap all of that and then be able to identify with different times that you've made decisions or mistakes or huge advances when those personality traits kind of show up and, and rise to the surface. Oh, that is such a great idea. Thank you. Yeah. Cause I'm right now in the middle of starting to hire some big positions for the company. Oh and, yeah. Um, <laughs> so that would be really good yeah. for myself to do. But in return, my question for you would be is, do you ever have employees take those or those oh, all the time? I'm a, I'm a consultant. So I actually provide those to my, my client. Why well, I say a consultant, I'm a consultant for the big five. And so I, mm -hmm. I give that test out and then assist companies on making hiring decisions based on the job description and how it aligns with, because there's some tasks in this world that are just energizing to us. Like I'm very relationship driven. So people think I'm a great salesperson, but it can be a challenge because I'm truly an introvert who just went through enough childhood trauma that I can show up and be whatever you want me to be, because that's how I was trained as a child. But what recharges me is, is quiet and, and peace and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I'm very industrious in my personality because a lot of my self-worth is, is tied to my impact and what I can contribute to someone. And so for a really long time, I, I suffered from like over volunteering because I wasn't worthy enough unless I was giving to my community and I was making this impact. And, and then I was depleted and going home to my family, not giving anything to them because I was so much trying to prove to myself and to the world that I had the right to take up space in it and mm -hmm. stuff. And so once I kind of got more familiar with my personality and what drives and motivates me, you know, yes, I can drive sales and business development, but I have zero attention to detail. So I have to hire someone to kind of assist me on saying who I should call, book the appointment, do the logistics. Then I just show up, honestly, you know, I mean, hire what you hate. Like I do not want a spreadsheet. I do not want to do data entry. I don't really care. I could honestly care less about my PL. I'm like one of those terrible business people is like, we got money. Okay, cool. We should be <laughs> no, that's hilarious because I'm the same way. Like, and I was also that coach where I was like ingraining it to people, know thy numbers, right? right. And now like, and I didn't practice it myself. Yeah. And I'm like, if you, my fiance would come with me to spread, she's like, we got to go over Pina. We got to go over this and the other. And I'm like, I can hear it. You guys handle it. I don't need to bog my energy down with that stuff. Like, just let me know if we're like in panic, we're in a fire, like, what we need to do, but as long as like the ship keeps going, like, let me just stay in my zone of genius. <laughs> right. And how much do you like change? Like some people love change just for change's sake to experience something new and meet new humans and, and be exposed to something that fascinates you while other people are like, no, I'll be right here. You can right. go adventure away. And, and so when we're promoting people and stuff like that, we want to look at what energizes them and what depletes their, their battery and then try to align 
their daily tasks to be most of what they excel at, right? Because we want the highest level of productivity out of them as far as the bottom line goes. But then as the the corporate responsibility is we want to create great environments that people want to contribute and that can show up as their whole self, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and that's not just an employee thing. That's a, who, who are, that's why I asked you about your childhood. Like, who are you? Where do you come from? What motivates you? What scares you? What makes you hesitate? What, you know, makes you wonder what keeps you awake at night and not enough employers know their employees the way that they should to be able to manage them and lead them really to greatness. So, you know, and they're confused by in the interview process, whether the person has a high moral character or if they're just charismatic, because they'll leave the conversation with each of those people feeling energized and good, like they're the one, but the narcissist will make you feel that all day, every day, but it doesn't mean that they have a high moral character. So we got to stop interviewing people on whether we feel connected to them or not and start really digging deeper and know their character, what they value, what is motivating and demotivating to them. If you dig into that, you can usually uncover the narcissistic tendencies and avoid nightmares in, in HR. So, oh my gosh, no, this is such a perfect timing conversation to have. Like, like I told you, like we're hiring for some really big roles right now. And, you know, I've hired lots of people in the past and even over the last few years for the company. And I hate the process because I love it. It's, it's like my favorite thing to do. Yeah. I, I hate it because one, I can connect with anyone and everyone. I can bring out the best in someone. I know what questions to ask, you know, as far as like making a connection goes. Right. But as far as then like having these great conversations and interviews and it's like, well, shoot, everyone looks good on paper. Everyone had a great conversation with, you know, just like you said, anyone can show up to an interview. Great. That doesn't make them a great employee or great for that position. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things, especially right now, it's like, I am the only one that really can do the hiring for the roles that we're hiring. Like, no, we don't have enough people in place yet to, you know, do those things. So it's stressful and it's costly and it makes me you know, at the end of the day, sometimes like not hire ro- like those big position roles because one, they're they're more you know they're more expensive people to hire. Liability, yeah. Liability. You don't want to make the wrong mistake, or you don't want to waste time with somebody that is just going to show up really good the first few days or weeks, and then end up right. like going off the deep end because they actually aren't happy or weren't really excited about the role like they were in the interview kind of a thing. So right. it, it's hard. It's it hard. Is. Happy, And I think there's a great deal of shame and embarrassment that a lot of business owners don't share when they've had a failed hire, you know, because they see themselves as, oh, I can bring out the best of anyone I can interview and, and, you know, I've got great discernment. I've had all these, you know, amazing successes, but then they have a couple bad hires and it's, it's very personal and separation, employment separation is very personal. When someone quits or you have to fire them, it is not taken lightly. And I don't think enough people give the weight to leaders and business owners who have to take away someone's livelihood, that have to make decisions that are going to impact children um, and in kind of the burden, the emotional burden that comes with being an employer, you know, um, it's, it's very heavy. I've had employees that, that have passed away. I've had, you know, tragic accidents happen. I've had, you know, the, the grief that's involved with losing people in business. I mean, in COVID I lost people that I dreamed with, you know, we built each other's businesses by promoting each other and referring business and I never met their wives. I never met their children, but I dreamed with them. And when the grief hit me with that loss, it was like, oh man, it was something like I wasn't expecting. So, um, but knowing those things about myself, right. Having lost my mom when I was only 23, suddenly, you know, those, those termination conversations and that separation of relationship always feels tragic, but having the, emotional intelligence to be able to identify that has helped me kind of fortify that weakness. I think Mm -hmm. that I have. Yeah. I need to like, I don't even know how you learn or, (laughs) you know, strengthen that skill, but 
that is definitely hardest. Yeah. Like, of course, yeah, making sure you make the right decision when you're hiring. But I have done many, not many, but like a lot of having to let someone go or firing conversations. And that's, right. that's the worst. I hate it. Like I, I, it's the guilt, it's the shame. It's the, you know, I blame myself. Like, did I not show up enough? Did I not give enough direction to make mm -hmm. sure they succeed? And mm -hmm. then it's like, you know, no, they just weren't doing their job anymore or, you know, weren't doing the thing, but yeah. It, it sucks from remembering the conversation or interview from day one and how the excitement and passion that they had to like at the end to see how it all kind of unraveled. But yeah, that's, it's the, one of the things of being a founder or business owner and to go through that and just yeah. make sure along the way, just to learn, learn the lessons and, yeah. you know, Absolutely. and hopefully just equip people like yourself to help consult along the way too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I always love to ask people, especially people who have had long journeys like you and, and it seems to be a life learner and always be morphing into the next best version of yourself. What, what would you tell 18 year old self either to bring more joy or to save yourself from grief? What business advice would you just want to uh, bestow upon them? Oh, I would say like, Follow your heart, your passion, your desire, and don't let anyone or anything else tell you that you can't until like you've gone through it and tried. I think that's, that, that is truly like my biggest thing. I think a lot of ways in my life, like I'm so proud of myself for pushing myself through and very much alone through a lot right. of those big transitional periods, right. which is really interesting. I don't know if that was just that ego or that fear of failure and making mm -hmm. sure, you know, I succeeded. But at the same time, it's like, gosh, I I wish I didn't care so much what other people thought or, you know, even just doubt in myself and, and just freaking went for it. Like at the end of the day, I hate the saying, but it's like life really is too short. Like just go do the thing. And no time is ever wasted. Like I could have looked at going to med school just because I went to college for four years and studied right. for it you know, but I'm you learned so how to learn there though. Yeah, exactly. Right. I learned. It's so funny. All the things that I learned in college about the human body and physiology and psychology. Yep. Guess what I teach on today, for you know, <laughs> literally I teach exactly. on that stuff now. So there was a big gap of about eight years where I didn't touch it. Right. But now I do. So every it's like, you know, I think it's what Steve jobs has the quote. Mm -hmm. You can never connect the dots forward. Right. But you can always connect them back. Yes. And and you just have to believe and trust in that. Yeah. That I think that is sound advice right there. I love that. Thank you so much, Samantha, for coming on and just talking to us today and sharing with you, uh, sharing with us a little bit more about your journey and and how you found yourself to where you are. Thank you so much for having me down. This was such a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks again for spending time with us today. If you want more HR stories and resources, go to simplythebest.com to join our newsletter. That's S-I-P-L-E-Y. Until next time, stay happy.